we ran it on QI a few years ago. Yeah. Um, which was, there's no such thing as a fish. Yeah, there's no such thing as a fish. No, seriously, it's in the Oxford Dictionary of Underwater Life. It says it right there, first paragraph, no such thing as a fish. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Covent Garden. My name is Dan Schreiber, I'm sitting here with the regular three elves, Andy Murray, Anna Chazinski and James Harkin, and once again we have gathered around the microphones to share our favourite facts from the last seven days. So again, let's do it, our favourite facts, James. My fact is that in 1903, a man called W. Reginald Bray posted himself. <laughs> <laughs> wow. How? How? He stuck a stamp on himself and walked down to the post <laughs> office and said, I want to be taken to, to a house, which happened to be his own house. And they took him. Yeah. Was it a slow day for him? <laughs> <laughs> Finished his book? <laughs> Didn't really know what to do? <laughs> he, was, um, he was a bit of a wag, a bit of a practical joker. Uh, and one of the things that he did was he read through all of the post office guide and worked out what the smallest and largest things he could post were. Um, so he discovered that the smallest item that he could post was 1B, and so he posted that. <laughs> and the largest was an elephant, but he couldn't find an elephant, so he posted himself. What year was this? Uh, 1903. 1903. It sounds like, because uh, there's so many examples of people just testing the limits of the posting system. Yeah. Like, just a bunch of practical jokers going, how far can we push this? There was a guy who um, sent an entire building's worth of bricks because he was building a bank in a different city and the cheapest way was just to send the bricks via the post. Oh my God, bricks. were they individually wrapped? No, I think I, that's what I hoped they were. That would be a brilliant admin job for someone, wouldn't it? Sticking the stamps on and putting them in. Yeah. Alex would love that. Yeah, he would. <laughs> he sent them at 40 at a time. They yeah. must have not introduced weight limits then. That must have been when they did that's, it by size. That's, where they, that's when, brought, when they introduced the scales. That's when they brought it in. Uh, 200 pounds per day became ah. the, uh, the limit that they then imposed. It, there's a weird um, history of people posting themselves. It's not just this guy. There's been a few since. A guy called Mr. Seng. I'm not sure where he was from. Um, he um, decided to post himself in a sealed box and he thought it would just be a 30 minute journey. Um, but they put him in the wrong pile <laughs> and he was um, stuck oh, no. in there for three hours. <laughs> Uh, and he didn't make a hole in his box, so he could hardly breathe. And when they cut him out, he'd passed out. <laughs> and um, when they interviewed him in the newspaper afterwards, he said, I tried to make a hole in the cardboard, but it was too thick. And I didn't want to spoil the surprise by shouting. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That was real dedication. Dedication to a surprise. <laughs> But then he can't really jump out and say surprise because he passed out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and was it a good surprise or was it like he was a burglar and <laughs> he was going to jump out and then ransack a house? Well, there was a guy who um, posted himself. Oh, what was it now? OK, so there was a guy who decided he wanted to cross America. Uh, and he was called Mr. McKinley. I don't know what his first name was. And he decided it'd be better to go in a box because he could charge the postage to his company rather than paying for the ticket, which mm. you'd have, have to pay for himself. That's how I get to work every day. It's the same <laughs> thing, yeah. <laughs> sorry, go on. Yeah, you're always arriving by second post, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Oh, snap. Yeah, that was... <laughs> I wouldn't mind, but I'm by far the latest in the yeah. office every day. Um, so he billed the $550 freight charge to his employer and climbed into the crate. Of course, by being in a plane, he was lucky he was in a plane which was like air conditioned and stuff. But a lot of them is very dangerous because they're, yeah. you know, it's very cold Freezing. and you can die in there. Um, <laughs> do you know you used to be able to send children by post? Really? Yeah. yeah. Did you? you? used to be able to post children around the place. <laughs> Until 1920, was it? In the US, anyway? Yeah. I think it was banned officially. Ent until around then. But you would buy the stamps and you would put the stamps on the child's jacket and then the child would sit in, for example, the mail van of the train. Yeah. And they were a bit of post. And yeah. you could, I think you could lump all your posts together because there are pictures of what? children many... with posts strapped to them and then they turn up and be like, That's not only clever. have I come. <laughs> well, wow. Just going back to W. Reginald Bray... Oh, yeah. He has his own website, which I didn't know. He's but, amazing. Yeah, but there, the website is absolutely fantastic. Um, he collected a lot of autographs, so he, he sent thousands of cards out to people asking them to be returned autographed to the, to the Pope or his local railway station master. Um, and on the website, it has this lovely line, which is, 
Over the years, Reginald amassed over 15,000 autographs, declaring himself the Autograph King, a title that was undisputed by his peers. <laughs> <laughs> Just imagine him saying, anyone going to challenge me? Um, no. <laughs> Imagine you were like his pretender. I think you wouldn't tell him that you had all these autographs and then you go up to him and go, excuse me, are you the guy who's got the most autographs in the world? Would you mind just signing the... <laughs> and then when he signed it, yeah. you have him beat. Yeah. yeah, you have one over him. Oh, that's good. That's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> the Ig Nobel people, Mark Abrahams and the Improbable people, they um, tried to send a helium balloon through the post. <laughs> and they wrote the address on the balloon and then took it to the post office. And when they weighed it, obviously it has negative of weight and so they were like well we're not going to pay you postage I think you should pay us postage <laughs> <laughs> the balloon was refused reasons given transportation of helium and not wrapped so I don't think you're not allowed to transport helium but anyway because it's oh, okay. explosive isn't it I mean, I mean it was wrapped the... they were wrapping helium in, in a, a balloon in a rubber that's true yeah. yeah so one of the most common um, questions that gets asked to the US postal system yep. is can you mail a dog um, they get this question all the time, says um, spokesperson Sue Brennan. The answer is no. Can't mail a dog. No. no. The whole point of postmen and dogs is that they don't get along. <laughs> Can you imagine a dog in a sorting office? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Did actually they've worked out how many for some reason they've only done this in Germany but 3,000 postmen a year are bitten by dogs in Germany um, and 2,255 pairs of trousers are torn resulting in 8 million pounds worth of medical bills in 2001 the German post office started teaching dog psychology to postmen it's just it's just a permanent ongoing war that's the all postman it, yeah dog battle the dog. except the postmen are not allowed to carry weapons and dogs are well they, they are weapons Oh, that's that's nah, mate. That's like saying, was it Joe Lewis who had his um, his fists um, designated a weapon or it was something Jackie like that? Chan. Was it? Yeah. I've Chan always is... heard about this and I've never believed it. Is it true? I think I th when you say you've always heard it, I think it's me literally repeating it <laughs> yeah. most days. Jackie Chan told uh, Whoopi Goldberg and a number of others on the View that when he's in America, he is considered his fists to be a uh, uh, an illegal weapon. Do you get all of your facts from The View? <laughs> uh, actually, no, I don't, because they're a bit... Um, <laughs> I remember watching an episode where they were talking about the possibility that the moon landings didn't happen, that it was a oh, hoax, yeah. and Whoopi Goldberg was going, I don't want to, like, speculate about the truth about it, but all I'm saying is, you know, who was filming Neil when he went down oh, on the God. ladder? Who was holding that camera? I don't want to speculate. It's like, Whoopi... Do you know, <laughs> Whoopi Goldberg <laughs> got her nickname due to her childhood flatulence. Oh, yeah, she was yeah. a big farter. Yeah. She whoopee. Yeah, that's right. That's good. Yeah. And she worked in a morgue, didn't she? Did she? I might mention that before. Putting makeup on corpses. Wow. And the, everyone, when she walked in, everyone's like, what's that smell? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not of people just woke up and walked out. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Who was it? Did someone send a load of wasps? Um, and yes. you can make wasps go to sleep and... F it, the play and they were sent on a flight and the flight was delayed oh. or something and they all woke up you can still <laughs> buy um parasitic wasps through the post and they're for um like pest control instead of using pesticides you can use them and then what do you get mailed to you to get rid of the parasitic wasp in infestation that you've now got? Um, then you get a spider to catch the fly. Fly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was always a big flaw in that song because cows don't eat dogs. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> okay, time for fact number two, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that the oldest edible ham has just celebrated its 112th birthday. So how one. do we know it's edible? Oh, because it's quite a famous famous ham it, it, uh, it first came to prominence when it celebrated its 100th birthday and uh, someone has since bought it and and I guess any time it has a birthday now people mention it so I wanted to dispute this claim because my local butcher Mr. Feller best butcher in the world you guys should all go to him market whoa, whoa, in whoa. Oxford no. are, we, are we sponsored by Mr. Feller now I have been past Mr. Feller's place in the cover market and I can confirm there is a very old ham in the window yeah. so. so he claims I think he bought it in 19 1993, when it was 101, it cost him 990 pounds, but he said he would have paid at least five grand for it because it was so special. It is now 125, he says. And There's he says that's challenge. edible. Now, when he bought it from uh, the auctioneer that was selling it off, they said they weren't sure it was edible, but he's the butcher. 
he should know. Why is he not in the news? Why is he it, not? It hasn't been proven. Hasn't is been it, officially verified. Is this like the autograph guy? Like no one else can be bothered. Mm. They're like, yeah, we have way older ham, dude. But like, we don't need the title of yeah. world oldest ham. I think he's, he's above that. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's similar to the world's tallest man, who I think was certified the world's, world's tallest man, and then he refused to do the tests anymore, so they stripped him of his title. And I think there is another man who is now officially the world's tallest man, but actually is slightly shorter than the previous man. Through. Why did he refuse to be remeasured? I, he doesn't want the hassle of being the world's tallest man. Because when you're the world's tallest man, people come to see you as if you're an attraction. I remember reading this odd fact about the idea that there are no children in the town. Um, not because he scared them away, but just because there's too much hassle to have a super tall guy and kids <laughs> in the same town. I can't remember the exact fact, but it it's was... Operation, he is the size of a yew tree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, old um, things that have been eaten. Um, a German pensioner who received a tin of American lard 64 years ago in an aid package has only just tasted it after discovering that it is still edible. Oh, wow. I just didn't want to throw it away, said Hans Feldmeier, 87. <laughs> See, that's the spirit which makes people keep ham for decades <laughs> yeah. when it's just a not very nice ham. Yeah, in 2005, we found a 4,000-year-old bowl of noodles in China. Uh, it's really quite like that they're still in the bowl. Um, yeah. And that settled the debate because there's quite a, quite a heated debate, I think, between Chinese, Arabs, and Italians over who first came up with a noodle. And mm. that's the oldest evidence of a noodle. So China's got it at the moment. Wow. Yeah. Speaking of well-preserved food, there's obviously the kiviak, the Inuit food, which is made from orcs that are preserved in the hollowed out body of a seal. Yeah. So you stuff them in there for seven or eight months and they're completely preserved. Then you get them out and eat them. Apparently they're pretty disgusting, but <laughs> that was them. But I do quite like the Wikipedia page, which is, so it's called kiviak. And at the top of the Wikipedia page, it says, not to be confused with Kiviak person. So sometimes I think Wikipedia goes overboard with their clarifications there. Mm. I don't think anyone's looked up their mate Kiviak and gone, hey, you never told me you were a foodstuff that gets preserved in a seal skin for eight months. Isn't there a thing with camels whereby if you have poisonous water, you get the camel to drink it um, and then it vomits it back up and that makes it... Um drinkable have you have you heard about this <laughs> i have not heard that why is it, it drinkable because a camel has thrown up in it well because uh, it filters it <laughs> there's something about it's a poisonous food or it's water or it's first something. website i'm getting is six dangerous urban survival myths about water <laughs> actually i'm reading this page now and it doesn't mention dan's insane camel theory Wow, this is really interesting. You shouldn't necessarily cut open those big barrel cacti. Um, the odds are that the inside will be tough and fibrous, the water contained will not be abundant, and also there's a greater chance the water inside will be bitter and acidic, which could induce vomiting, diarrhoea, and cramp. Oh, well, at least if you vomit it, someone else could drink it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine having a magic vomiting camel which could purify anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I've got it wrong somewhere. I think it's I think it's to do with food. Google food. Okay. Camel vomit survival. <laughs> If anyone knows about this camel weird survival tip, then send us a message to at yeah. Triberland or... I read, I read a thing about how um, we have been making attempts to create food that lasts longer. So obviously this ham is kind of an anomaly in that it's, it's very old and that's very notable. But in the army, because they, um, they obviously have to have food that's nicely preserved, but they want people to eat well, they've been attempting to make interesting, long-lasting foods. And sandwiches is one of the big things... Most soldiers, apparently, want sandwiches. They've currently made a sandwich which can last for two years and not go stale or soggy. Oh. And the people who made it are trying to work what they're calling an immortal peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That's the dream. So we can be at war forever. Hooray! <laughs> That's what they want. They just, uh, one soldier said, they're the best two-year-old sandwiches I've ever eaten. <laughs> Did you know that they fill all crisp packets with nitrogen instead of with oxygen? So that it, the, the crisps don't go off. Instead of with air. They don't put air in. They get rid of all the oxygen in the packets to keep them fresh. Yeah, Ash was telling me. Ash, yeah. who is the, uh, the lead singer of Emperor Yes, who did our theme tune, um, he was saying that when sparkling water is transported overseas, mm. they take the bubbles out, and Wait, then they put the it... bubbles back in... 
often when they reach their country destination. Has no one heard this? You can no. Okay, if anyone listening uh, can help me out, is that what still water is? They forgot to put the bubbles back in. Yeah, that's when the bubbles have ended up in a different country. Um, Um, I do know that when they make decaf coffee, they send they sell the caffeine to soft drinks companies to put into soft drinks. Isn't that amazing? I I would love to know what caffeine looks like. Isn't it funny how you said that and I just accepted it, and when Dan said his thing, (laughs) I just immediately (laughs) thought it was rubbish. It's the the boy who cried wolf writ large. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, it's time to move on to fact number three, and that is Chazinski. Yes, my fact is that orangutans like playing on iPads, but gorillas do not. Really? Yeah. Uh, so this actually started as an April Fool's joke by The Sun, and the heading of their article was Planet of the Apps, saying how gorillas love playing angry Very birds. Good. And yeah, good old son, always one step ahead with the wit. And it gave the idea, to Mil- uh, some guy who worked at Milwaukee County Zoo read this article and thought, hey, actually, apps for apes, good idea, and started showing gorillas iPads. But they didn't like it because so gorillas are, feel threatened by uh, direct eye contact and face-to-face contact. So they do a lot of their interacting sight in a side long way. And so oh. that doesn't work very well with iPads because you can't really see it properly. And then as soon as you look at it, you feel a like the birds trying to attack you and they smash it. <laughs> wow. Right. There is a thing about gorillas and eye contact. Um, there was a zoo that gave out these glasses. Do you remember that? Um, and they were glasses with pinholes in so you could still see them, but they had pictures of eyes looking in different mm. directions. And the idea was you would look at the gorillas, but the gorillas wouldn't know that you were looking at them. Yeah, I think it's Rotterdam Zoo, isn't it? And I yeah. think it was off, I might have been after a woman got attacked by a gorilla. Yeah. The only downside, it seems, is that so they play on these iPads for up to half an hour. But if you give it to them to hold, they have smashed quite a few in the past. So the zookeeper or the staff have to hold the iPad while the orangutans play on That's it. That's right. I think the it's a bit of a hassle. I think I read the average length of an unsmashed um, iPad left alone with an orangutan. Is mm-hmm. 15 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. that's the limit. Well, wow. which is actually the um, battery life as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really, really like orangutans. I think they're brilliant. They're, they're solitary, apparently. Yes. So yeah. they spend all of their time. They know their neighbours by sight, but avoid all contact with them. So in that sense, not unlike Londoners. Um, <laughs> but, they, but they also make a lot of noise to advertise their whereabouts so that they can avoid each other. It's something rather beautiful and tragic about that isn't it just yeah. everyone going around saying here i am don't come near me um <laughs> again british they're british Very, yeah. <laughs> they've come up with the idea of showing orangs in other zoos orangs you're familiar <laughs> <laughs> they don't uh, like that andy <laughs> yeah they've come up with the idea of showing orangutans in other zoos uh pictures of orangs they might like to have sex with they might like to mate with so that they can do breeding programs rather than going to the hassle of transporting an orangutan across the country and then to find out they actually they don't fancy each other but can they fancy each other through a screen I wonder yeah basically it's like tinder I don't know yeah Yeah. isn't that weird another similarity with us is that the it's the younger ones take to the iPads much better than the older ones the older ones are much more set Mm. in their ways same thing an orangutan was the villain in the first ever detective story Oh, oh, what's really? supposed to be the first murder, ever murder, detective? Morgue, so murders in the room morgue. Spoiler alert, the murderer is an orangutan. Oh, <laughs> um, spoiled it. You can't say spoiler alert afterwards, can you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, it was Hamlet's stepdad. Spoiler alert. Um, um, Ash told me uh, oh, no. that... <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently dolphins, when they, when they start communicating... The words that they'll use to communicate, the first word will be their name, and then the second word word will be the action they're doing. So I'd be like, Dan, drinking, and they all they can pick their name as well. That does sound more familiar to me. I think I have heard that, that dolphins use their names. That's how you know when someone's about to speak on University Challenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so say, dolphins would be good on Yeah, Thompson, Edinburgh. Yeah. Flipper, UCL. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Quite useful for people who forget people's names, though. Wouldn't that be a great social yes. habit if oh everyone had to say their own name before they started speaking? Yeah. God, my life would be a lot easier. So much better, yeah. Um, under European regulations, pigs have to be mentally stimulated because I think pigs are quite intelligent, so they get easily bored. Um, <laughs> so they've developed pig chase 
the pig video game. Have you guys seen this? And mm. you can play a video game with a pig as a person, and they have this huge screen in their sty, and there's like a glowing light on it, and you control the light, and the pig snuffles up and follows the light, and the aim is to get your finger on the iPad to make contact with the pig's snout on the light, and then you guide it towards a goal, and then you score, and there's a big display of fireworks. They're very good at it, apparently. That's great. I'd love to play a pig at a computer game. Do you think I'd you might stand win? a higher chance of winning, yeah. <laughs> you used to be able to play chickens at uh, Knots and Crosses in oh, America. Yeah. Um, they had these machines. There was definitely one in Coney Island. I'm not sure where the others were, but there were a few. And it was impossible to beat them. Because Great. it's impossible to lose at Knots and Crosses if you play the right move, mm. they were trained to always go in the right place. Okay. And so you would play these chickens at Knots and Crosses and you could never beat them. Wow. So if you can't beat a chicken at Knots and Crosses, Andy, I don't fancy your chances playing a... a pig at Call of Duty. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now it's time for our final fact of the show, and that is Andy Hunter Murray. Okay, my fact is that the 1888 Encyclopedia Britannica entry for Wales reads, See England. (laughs) Does it mean a place where you can see England? (laughs) (laughs) Maybe. That's nice. Um, I think it's... So I, I just thought this would be time to rectify this, you know historical imbalance and poor treatment by Britannica. But James, actually, you found something that co- that makes this more complicated, or well, that it's not just an example of England being totally you know, anti-Welsh. That, or, no, I've seen you know. the assertion on a few websites, and I found the text of the actual Britannica, and um, it seems like the, the thing which is entitled England is actually about England and Wales. It's about South Britain. Right. In the article for England, it says, Legal phraseology is not quite consistent on this head, but the more accurate description of South Britain is England and Wales rather than England only. Okay. And in the article, they mention England and Wales as the whole thing rather than just England. I see. I That's mean, good in a way, you yeah. know. Yeah. So I thought Wales. Time for Wales. I like Wales. They've got the world's largest underground trampoline. Oh yeah, I know. Wow. I really want to go there. It's yeah, about the launch. Yeah, yeah. I think it's open now. I think. Yeah, it opened yeah. about two weeks ago. No, sorry. What? <laughs> oh my god. It's larger than St Paul's Cathedral, and it, it's a place that's already famous because it has the world's longest zip wire. Oh wow! Dan, the, if we'll put photos of the underground trampoline up here because this is um, it's unbelievable. <laughs> um, James, you've got a you've got a mug here, which is a, has a Welsh word on it. Uh, yeah, the Welsh uh, train place. Hmm. Um, which is the longest um, single word train place in the UK on Anglesey. Yeah, can you say the word? Uh, I can try. Go for it. Might not be spot on, but it's something like um, Now, if you've spotted any mistakes in that, write in no, don't to write. James's <laughs> personal mobile phone number, <laughs> which I'll read out now. <laughs> but the uh, thing about that is that um, that was a manufactured name. Yeah, it's called Llanfair PG, uh, Llanfair Pool Gwingeth. And um, they added all the extra bits, I think, as a publicity stunt. They wanted a record. Oh, really? Yeah, it, yeah. Was, it was a very early publicity stunt where they tried to turn themselves into a notable mm. town, and, uh, and it worked. There are did places work, which have done that. There's a place, um, there's a place called, oh, God, what's it called? Hamilton, Ohio, which has an exclamation mark after Hamilton. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> but they changed it. They just voted on it in the 70s just to for fun. put the exclamation mark in. Yeah. They hadn't just turned themselves into a musical. No, it sounds like a musical, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But they, they wanted um, they wanted more tourists and they wanted more revenue from tourists. So they so they did that. And it worked. I think it worked. But did also... It? That's the best yeah. they could come up with. Put an exclamation mark <laughs> at the end of their name. Well, well, I mean, it's cost effective, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I went to Slamfair, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, don't, from, we'll definitely get letters for that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Say the short one. Slamfair PG. I went there because um, I was in North Wales and it was about a 50 mile drive from where I was, but I just wanted to go to that place. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I bought a mug. So, there you know, we go. True. Now, if mug? everyone did that, they'd sell 60 million mugs a year. <laughs> so, yeah. the, uh, there was a town in America as well that claimed to be the center of the universe. Danny Wallace did this as a book. <laughs> yeah. Because um, it just no one else knew where the center of the universe yeah, was. Yeah, the, the said. mayor said something like um, I've spoken to a lot of physicists and astrophysicists, and they said that the universe doesn't really have a center. So, if nowhere else is claiming to have it, then I think we'll have it. And he claimed there was like a bench or a manhole cover or something in the middle of the town. He said, right, this is the center of the universe, and they put a little plaque up. Amazing. Good, good gimmick. I think that's quite fun. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, so, okay, that was pretty bold of Britannica to do that. But yeah. you're you're saying that's a bit of a disputed. No, it's not disputed. It's they definitely did do that, and Wales obviously deserves its own section. Mm. In that we have a 1911 Britannica in this office, and um, that has a very large section on Wales. So they oh. soon amended it. Yeah, I was wondering if when you said when you told us this fact, whether maybe if you turned to England, it would have an entry that was like Sea Wales, which <laughs> did used to happen. So there's this guy who's written this really good book called Reading the OED. It's by Amon Shea, and he read the whole OED recently. It was before it was uh, re-edited in 2007, I think. So he read the OED from before that and found a bunch of hilarious stuff, one of which was the word unpoetic, for which the entry just said CF below, and the word below was unpoetical and it said cf above so that was quite a good oh, one lovely uh there are other excellent ones so there's one that's created for the word disgibeline which is d-i-s-g-h-i-b-e-l-l-i-n-e and the definition is to distinguish as a guelph from a ghibelline <laughs> well someone was really proud of himself for coming up with that as sounds well. like leah yeah. doesn't it that I yeah mean, him from him. sounds like a milf guelph a grey whale, I'd a like gr- to be yeah. uh, <laughs> friend. A friend, yeah. yeah. Friend. In the first edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, which was even more basic and rude than the, the 1888 one, rude is in simple, not as in rude, but the entry for woman just says, the female of man, see homo. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> um, and the entry on tobacco says that excessive use is capable of, quotes, drying up the brain to a little black lump consisting of mere membranes. <laughs> oh, they should put that on cigarette packets, shouldn't they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, there was a book. Um, you know in the OED how you have um, sources for each of the things. So it'll have, what was that word you just said? Disgibeline. Oh, it would have disgibeline and then it would have um, the source for, for where they found it, mm-hmm. which book they found it in. There are uh, 51 words in the OED um, which have the source meanderings of memory by someone called Nightlark. And no one knows what that book is. Oh, Do they know who uh, Nightlark is? No. Nope. That's great. Just very quickly on this idea of the mysterious um, book. mysterious book. Yeah. Um, I, I read this story when I was looking into stuff about posting uh, yourself across the country. In 1976, so starting in 1976, residents in a small town called Circleville in Ohio, population 13,000, um, they all started receiving these letters accusing them of various misdeeds and the letters were just anonymous no one knew but everyone in the town was getting them wow and they had theories as to who was sending them there was a theory that it was a writer called ron giuseppe um who was writing them uh but then he mysteriously died but the letters continued coming to them until the 1990s and then they just stopped it's a bit like i know what you did last summer yeah. And I know what you did last summer, and I know what you did last <laughs> summer. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what they did last summer. I've never seen it. Oh, they uh, killed someone with yeah, a car. They hit- Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so bringing it back to Wales, uh, it does at least get the chance to laugh in our faces when we cock up, which we often do where Wales is concerned. So street signs are a, quite a famous example, aren't they? There was that sign that went up yeah. in Wales a couple of years ago. So there was the English above, which said something like, take the next left if you want to get to X place. And then the translation in Welsh below actually translated as... I am not in the office at the moment. Send any work to be translated. (laughs) (laughs) There's a sign between Cardiff and Penarth that tells cyclists that they've got a problem with an inflamed bladder. Uh, That's what the translation is. And there's a sign for pedestrians in Cardiff that reads, look right in English. And the Welsh translation below is, look left. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that's it. That's the end of our show. Those are all of our facts. Thanks, everyone, for listening. If you want to get in contact and talk more about the stuff that we've been mentioning on this podcast, you can get Andy on... At Andrew Hunter M. James. At Egg Shaped. Anna. You can email podcast at qi.com. And if you want to get through to me to save me from being fired for all of my missed facts uh, and want to help me out on the idea that maybe camels do vomit up stuff that we can then re-eat, that bubbles are taken out of sparkling water and reintroduced into the bottle on the other side of the journey, I can be got on at Schreiberland. 
Um, you can also go to qi.com slash podcast where we're going to have all of the facts that we've been talking about as well as links to further research to extra videos and pictures of that giant trampoline and so on. And we've also got all the other episodes that we've done uh, and you can explore those pages as well. We'll be back again next week. Goodbye. Just to add a post-podcast addendum to that, Dan and Andy are currently absent from the QI offices, both performing shows in Edinburgh. Uh, they've got two shows each, so Andy's got Ostentatious and Folly Addo, so obviously go to both of those multiple times if you're listening. And Dan will be performing his stand-up Cock Blocked from Outer Space, and he's also going to be in the Museum of Curiosity, which is doing live shows at Edinburgh. So anyone who's anywhere near there should definitely go to see them, apparently they're... Apparently they're quite funny. <laughs> and if you'd like to buy any ham, please go to <laughs> Mr. Feller's Ham Shop in Oxford. Do best ham in the country and the oldest.